Hey, a pleasure meeting you here, you lovely people of YouTube. My name is Elon Osborne, and this is my channel where I talk about movies, audio, and music. And today, I'm going to go over the brand new Costco exclusive Klipsch Reference Cinema System 5.1.4 with Dolby Atmos. If you're interested in the unboxing, I already made a separate video for that in case you missed it, which I'll link in the description below. In this video, I'll be touching on setup, how it sounds, and receiver recommendations. So in the words of Samuel Jackson, Hold on to your butts. Setup. This is a good old fashioned wired system, so it will need to be powered by a nine channel receiver. Five ear level speakers plus four upward firing Atmos speakers equals nine. And for this demonstration, I have an Onkyo TX-NR787. But the main concept will be the same no matter which brand you have. The satellite speakers can be mounted, so if that's your jam, go for it. I had some speaker stands for my front left and right speakers and some, uh, makeshift stands for my surrounds. <laughs> there are some soundbar wireless systems out there that specifically have speaker placements labeled on them. But since these are all wired speakers, any of the four satellites can be left, right, surround, whatever. Once I placed the speakers in their desired positions, it was time to get them wired. Since I had some 14 gauge wire already in place in my testing area, I just got some more 14 gauge wire that I had in my possession and went to town. But I did show in the unboxing video that this system does come with nine speaker wires and a subwoofer cable that are 25 feet long a piece. So for most, that will be more than enough. So right off the bat, let me tell you that using 14 gauge wire on the satellites was kind of a pain. The spring-loaded binding posts are kind of a pain to deal with in general, and since the holes provided are so small, you can't use banana plugs. So I had to make sure that I left about an inch or more of bare wire. But no matter how tight I twisted that bare wire, since it was so long, it would easily catch on the way down, bunch up or bend, causing me to pull it back out, retwist it, and reset and try again. But that's kind of on par with this home theater introductory all-in-one speaker system that Klipsch has created. It's the same build quality as the 5.1 reference theater pack, spring-loaded binding posts, and hard plastic cabinets, so it makes sense. I just wish it had your standard five-way binding posts, but I am happy to say that the speakers did eventually get connected to the receiver. It just took a little longer than I was anticipating. Speaking of connecting to a receiver, it's pretty self-explanatory, but I'll go over it just in case. As you can see on the back, you have nine pairs of binding posts, red being positive, black being negative. Since I review a lot of speakers, I've invested in banana plugs that I just plug straight into the binding posts. But you can also just unscrew them a bit and stick a bare wire through the opening at the bottom or the top and screw it back into place until it's snug but no need to go overboard with how tight you get it. Front right goes into front right positive and negative, front left, center, surround left, and surround right. As you can see, the next binding posts are labeled height one, which corresponds to our front height speakers. So plug them into height one left, height one right. Now, these next binding posts are clearly labeled surround back if you were to set up a 7.1.2 at most setup. But since the system is only designed to be 5.1.4, you can see here that the binding post can also be assigned in the software to either zone 3 or height 2. So we plug in the height 2 left and height 2 right wires that are coming from the surround speakers. Now take the provided subwoofer cable that you got in the box, plug it into the mono slash LFE channel on the subwoofer, and then go ahead and plug it into subwoofer 1 on the receiver. Now we're dealing with the software side of things. I went into speaker, configuration, then chose 5.1.4, subwoofer yes, height one and two I set to Dolby speaker since they are upward firing. I then set the crossover frequency to 100 hertz with ear level speakers since they can only go down to 90 or 80 hertz. So anything about 100 hertz and below was handled by the subwoofer. The heights I set to 120 hertz since they typically don't reproduce any low frequencies at all. Now at this point, typically you want to go into the software and run Odyssey, or in this case with the Onkyo, they have their own room calibration software called AccuEQ, which you are more than welcome to do. But whenever I run it, I usually have to go back in and fix things that AccuEQ got 
way wrong. So since I just needed a good foundation for calibration, enough to just be able to watch some demo scenes, I just did it the old fashioned way. I took a tape measure to see how far away each speaker was to the main listening position, then input those measurements into this page here. Next up, I level matched the speakers by using an app called DB Meter Pro that measures the decibels of incoming sound. I'm sure there are plenty of apps out there like it, so if you want to go that route, do it. I sat in the main listening position, went into level calibration, went through all the speakers one by one playing pink noise through them, and adjusted the levels so that they all read 75 decibels where I sat. The subwoofer is powerful, so I set the gain knob on the back to 50%, then adjusted the volume in the receiver's software to read 75 decibels from the main listening position. There are more little adjustments that can be made, but for the purposes of this review, I just left it at that since it was a good baseline to start watching movies and have it sound good. I could have run REW and adjusted EQ settings too, but honestly, I just wanted to have some fun watching movies. I mean, can you blame me? Yes. So speaking of these speakers and movies, how do they sound? Let's just say having the word cinema in the title of this system is on point. Klipsch has done a great job carving their own little niche into the home theater space by offering these unique introductory packages. I still believe that the 5.1 reference theater pack is the best introductory home theater speaker system for those who are starting from nothing. Still listening to TV speakers or wanting to go bigger than just a sound bar, owning a receiver and wired speakers with the intent of expanding and upgrading over time. Costco has it on sale for $2.99 at certain times of the year. Newegg.com has it sometimes for $2.89. And you cannot beat the price for what you end up getting. It can get loud and it packs a punch for how small those speakers and subwoofer are. But then Klipsch decided, you know what? Let's offer a budget option for those wanting to jump straight into Atmos. We'll keep the costs down with plastic cabinets, spring-loaded binding posts, that kind of thing. Reference theater pack adjacent, you feel me? But we'll just make it bigger. And it's not just bigger, it's better. It honestly does feel and sound more cinematic than its 5.1 cousin. The center channel did a tremendous job with dialogue, even when Gandalf is speaking in Lord of the Rings, which is saying a lot. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's so annoying how much he whispers and mumbles his lines throughout that entire trilogy. But this center speaker was bright enough to where his mumblings weren't as incoherent as other speakers I've heard in the past. And the four satellites sounded large. They have 5.25 inch woofers, so they're closely related to the R51M bookshelves. Granted, their frequency response only dips down to 90 hertz instead of the R51M 62 hertz, but since they only go down to 90 hertz, it does kind of have this audio reproduction that sounds a tad flat at times. More expensive satellite speakers whose frequency response dips down to 60, 50, or even 40 hertz do have this richness to the details in the dialogue, sound effects, music, etc. These Klipsch satellites do sound a bit mid-range forward and not as airy or neutral as, say, SVS Prime satellite speakers. But clearly you get what you pay for, and these still sound pretty darn good for how much you'll be spending. And don't forget that these satellites have upward firing speakers built in, which SVS Prime satellites do not. And speaking of those upward firing drivers, it was honestly a little hard to gauge their effectiveness. With my 10 foot ceilings, it's not ideal for bouncing sound off it. I'd say nine feet max, but eight feet I think is the sweet spot in my opinion. But they did provide something. I took the upward firing drivers out of the equation during my tests by changing the configuration in the software to just 5.1. And that did make a difference. With my 10 foot ceilings going back to 5.1.4, it unfortunately didn't make it seem like things were coming literally out of the ceiling, but it did add height to the sound. There was this bubble of audio that seemed to hover a few feet above the speakers. So it gave it this larger scale that felt more immersive more cinematic. But I will say this, you're going to benefit more from the rear satellites bouncing audio off the ceiling if you can place them behind and to the sides. My listening position is against the wall, so I can only have the surrounds flanking me on either side. So by the time the audio hits the ceiling and comes back down, it kind of overshot my listening position. But 
Since I'm forced to keep the ear level satellites fairly close to my listening position, that means I can hear the direct sound coming from the upward firing drivers, not just the reflection off the ceiling. So that's what creates that extended bubble of audio that's not just present when listening to 5.1. Case in point, the scene in Blade Runner 2049 where Agent K is getting his baseline test at police headquarters, the one where he's being asked questions like, do you feel that there's a part of you missing? Interlinked. Interlinked. If listening in 5.1, when the questions are being asked, it's clearly a voice coming from either side, right at ear level. But when I switch back to 5.1.4, the voice asking questions was now located not out of the ceiling, but in this space just beyond my head. Pretty cool effect. And compared to the reference theater pack, yeah, it's just bigger and better. Like I said, there was this larger bubble of audio compared to sound just surrounding me on one plane. And with the larger cinema speakers dipping down 20 to 30 hertz more in their frequency response, the sound just added a little bit more body behind it, a little more impact. It's like the 5.1 reference theater pack is the little engine that could. Because it has sound that's much bigger than you expect it to be. But this new cinema system takes that concept and steps it up a notch, but still within the budget tier. Now let's touch on the subwoofer a bit. As soon as Blade Runner 2049 starts, you're hit with this huge drum sound that reverberates into oblivion followed by several sub-bass sweeps starting somewhere around 200 hertz and dipping down low. And yeah, I've demoed that intro so many times that I could tell the sub-bass sweep died much sooner than I was used to, since this subwoofer only goes down to 32 hertz. That and this subwoofer suffers from the same issue as the little 8-inch sub that comes with the 5.1 theater pack. The driver is literally too big and powerful for the cabinet it's housed in. When I first set the whole system up, I had the gain dial set to about 50%, just as a good starting baseline. But as soon as Blade Runner 2049 began, it was way too much. The cabinet itself rattled, the pictures on my walls shook, and there was an annoying chuffing coming from the rear base port since there was just too much air being forced out at once. That's one thing that's inherent with cheap subs. Too big for their britches. That's why expensive subs are expensive. Not because they can get louder, I mean big whoop but because their cabinets are so rigid that the result is undistorted, accurate, and clean bass frequencies. So with this sub, after I turned the gain knob to about 25%, then it was much better. A cleaner, fuller bass extension that complemented the system rather than overpowering everything else. Now that we got that out of the way, how in the hell are you supposed to power this system? Well, that's the tricky part. I already mentioned that you'll need a nine channel receiver, but for some stupid reason around 2018 or so when Atmos was really starting to get popular in the home theater space, manufacturers decided that nine channel receivers would now only come with pre-outs, jacking up the price significantly. Little did I know when I got my Onkyo TX NR787 back in 2017 that it would become somewhat of a treasured commodity now since it does not have pre-outs keeping the cost down. I remember when I was price watching it like a hawk during the holiday season of 2017, and when it dipped down to $500, yes, $500, you better believe that I snatched that up because I had a 5.1.4 system in mind for my living room. Because here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. Since the Klipsch cinema system is introductory, and since the power ratings of the speakers aren't spectacular, I mean, 75 watts RMS is nothing to write home about, I would not recommend external amps if you happen to already be utilizing those in your system. Whatever amps are already inside your receiver, perfect. That's all you need for this Klipsch cinema system. But as I already said, Nine channel receivers without pre-outs are hard to come by, especially in 2021. And I still think to this day, Onkyo and Pioneer are the only manufacturers that sell them. The new Onkyo TX NR7100 is slated to come out any minute now, but after just looking at Crutchfield's website, it still says the shipping date is unknown. But that'll still cost you $1,100. So if you're wanting a nine channel receiver without pre-outs right now, you'll have to get a used one from eBay or Craigslist, wherever. The TXNR787 like I have, or the slightly newer TXNR797 are in that category. But the only downside to that is you're stuck with the receiver's power only. So if you wanna get into nine channel Atmos now, 
but want the flexibility of future expansion without having to purchase a new receiver, you could just bring for a more expensive nine channel receiver. And there are a plethora to choose from right now. Denon X3700H, X4700H, Marantz SR6015, SR7015, the Onkyo RZ50, which should be shipping any day now, NAD T778, Yamaha RXA6A, Pioneer Elite LX504. So that way you can utilize the internal amps for now with this Klipsch Cinema system. Then slowly build out your system with better speakers and eventually getting some external amps to power those speakers. But if you've been following this channel, you know that I am team separates for life. No matter how great your receiver is, it will still perform better with the aid of external amps sharing the load. Lastly, let me leave you with this thought. If you have a seven channel receiver and want to pick up this Clip Cinema system, I don't see anything wrong with that. Will you be able to utilize all the Atmos high channels? No, but since the upward firing speakers are okay with this budget cinema system. I would almost argue that you could probably do just fine with this package as a 5.1.2 Atmos system because the ear level speakers and subwoofer are great for the price you pay. And just having two speakers bouncing sound off the ceiling might be enough for now. But let's dive into speculation territory for just a second, shall we? It seems like Costco might have put the cart before the horse here. With the cinema system seemingly coming out of nowhere, does this mean Costco will finally start carrying a nine channel receiver in the near future? Maybe. Because up until now, they've only carried seven channel receivers. But why offer a speaker system that requires a nine channel receiver and not also sell one to perfectly match it? I have no inside source with Costco whatsoever, so this is a pure hypothetical, but maybe they released the cinema system now because they're planning on carrying the new Onkyo TX-NR7100 in store. But since it's Costco, they'll probably call it the XL900 for some strange reason, even though it's identical to the NR7100. Only time will tell. Recap. Is this better than the 5.1 reference theater pack? Yes. Is it worth $849? Eh. Although it is Costco, so this may just be an introductory price to see how it sells at first. And I imagine it'll go on sale during certain times of the year, bringing it down to $7.49 online and possibly even $6.49 in store. Is it worth $6.49 in store though? Oh, absolutely. How does it compare to the other Costco deal? The 5.0.2 Atmos system with the two towers? Hmm. Could that possibly be a video that's coming soon? <gasps> Better subscribe to find out if you're not already. Just saying. So is this Clip Cinema system the greatest of all time? No, of course not. It's still in the budget zone with the okay subwoofer, okay frequency responses, okay build quality, and those annoying little spring-loaded binding posts. But it still has big cinema sound, despite all those things. So it just might be the perfect system for you. And there you have it. Thank you so much for sticking with me on this one. There was a lot to go over, so I really do appreciate it. So now that you've heard my opinion, what are your thoughts? Is it in your Costco cart right now? Are you going to be on the search for a used 9-channel receiver? Or are you going to go for a more expensive 9-channel receiver with the hopes of future expansion? Are you going to get this anyway and power it with your 7-channel receiver that you have already? Let me know in the comments below. As always, please be kind to each other out there. Don't just watch TV and movies, experience them. And of course, always be listening.